Good day, Paul. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Um, a little of my background for our audience uh, regarding you and I. It seems like I've known you just about forever, at least as long as I've been in the business. I started attending NSPI conferences back in 1980, and I missed one during that first decade. And I'm not sure exactly when I met you, but I, ha I know it had to be early on in that, uh, in that time frame. For our audience, would, could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live, where you work, what you do, and perhaps some of the more interesting things that you've worked on in your career? Great, and, and thanks for this opportunity, Guy. I appreciate this. So I am Paul Elliott. I live uh, just outside Annapolis, Maryland, which is a wonderful place. We've been there 35 years. Uh, if you've never had the opportunity, be sure to visit. Um, my background uh, started as an undergraduate in psychology with a fascination in human learning and the use of technology. Now this is back, uh, it was, there were no PCs, there were mainframes and uh, mini computers and um, we were required as undergraduates to do a senior thesis. And I graduated from Rutgers in 1970 and my thesis was computer simulation of human cognitive processes. So back then, I was taking decks of punch cards to the computer center at night to run them to see if we could uh, generate answers from the computer that uh, simulated or were analogous to what human decision making would look like. Mm -hmm. And uh, ended up with that interest in human learning uh, did my PhD at University of Illinois working on a very early, back then we called it computer assisted instruction system called Plato. Uh, the company that built that was um, OG out of uh, Minneapolis. I'm drawing a total blank because they're no longer in business. Uh, but it was uh, part of the very early DARPA network, which was the pre-internet. And I was on funding from the government and uh, was working on using that tool to look at ways of more effectively and efficiently getting information into people's heads. Because I had this belief, later to learn unfounded belief, that if we could get it, the right information into people's heads quicker and faster and more effectively, it would impact performance. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of the underlying bias of many people in learning and instructional design. Mm -hmm. So I finished up my degree, uh, went to work in industry at a nuclear power plant. Uh, that was fascinating. It was post Three Mile Island. And what we had learned is that human error can override a lot of issues. And so were, Three Mile Island was a very small technical problem that was multiplied many times over by human error. And so they were revamping all the training across the nuclear industry and I got involved in that. Um, right about that time, a small company in Michigan called General Motors was looking at the introduction and this is uh, mid 80s and they were going to infuse 55 billion dollars that was a lot of money in the 80s of new technology into the manufacturing process and they were looking for current best practices uh, to upskill their workforce and uh, basically i was recruited by gm but went to work for a, a vendor uh, to support GM to look at how to upskill the workforce with all this new technology. That story is important because we spent the first six months of that project benchmarking current best practices in technical training. So uh, it went to the Johnson Space Flight Center, uh, commercial airline training centers, et cetera, et cetera. And as part of that benchmarking, GM had identified this guy down outside of Atlanta who had something called a, the JAWS workshop, 
the Job Aids Workshop. And so uh, along with going to all these industry programs we uh, or operations that were actually training facilities staffed by industry folks, uh, my GM colleagues and I went to the workshop. And I refer to that workshop, it was a two, two and a half day workshop, and, you know, this is mid 80s, as the, the two by four across the side of my head that changed my life professionally forever. Because I walked into the workshop and at the end of the two days I realized we were pumping lots of information into people's heads that never should have been in their heads. Uh, it was complex. It changed frequently. It had very high consequence of error. It was in, uh, infrequently performed. All the characteristics that meant human memory was the wrong place to store it. Uh, and subtly at that point, the idea of accomplishments versus behaviors was introduced to me. So I went on, continued to work with a consulting firm, started to collaborate with Joe at that company, and we started to use front-end analysis extensively with our clients, so started to use the accomplishment-based curriculum development model. And so my whole shift, my whole mental model went from human learning to human performance. And uh, the, the firm that I was part of, uh, it was a start, I, I was the first employee, there were a couple of investors, I was the first employee. We used that tool set extensively to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, it went from the two investors and me, a year later it was about 300 people, ended up being three or 4,000 people. Uh, so we saw a lot of growth. Uh, during that time, uh, Joe wanted to retire. Now, if you know Joe, he was pretty sure when he made a decision what he wanted to see come out of that decision. And he was convinced that the intellectual property he had produced could be successfully leveraged without him being part of the firm. The CEO of the firm had done other acquisitions, but it always involved the principal individual coming with the intellectual property, you know, for a two or three year earn out. Well, when those two folks were in the room, the CEO of the firm I was part of and Joe, uh, I've said to folks, I don't think there were ever two stronger egos in the same place at the same time in human history. And uh, uh, Joe wasn't going to bend. He wanted to retire. And Bob, the CEO, wasn't going to bend because he couldn't envision that all the job aids and tools that Joe had produced could be leveraged without Joe being physically part of the organization. So the deal didn't move forward. Uh, by this time, this was uh, 96, 97, 1996, 97, uh, that time frame. And after a year, Joe came back to me and said, Paul, why don't you take over my intellectual property? And I reflected on that for a little bit of time, certainly uh, more than seconds, but not too many days, and decided that's really what I wanted to be doing. So in 1998, uh, Joe did retire. I acquired his intellectual property and started a company called Human Performance Technologies. And uh, in that context, the focus of the company was more like the Harless Performance Guild. It was focused more on equipping client organizations to do this kind of work using the rich job aids that Joe had produced around how to do front-end analysis, how to design training, how to develop training. Uh, how to produce job aids. Uh, and so it was a publishing company. It was a 
workshop company, and we also did consulting. And um, not only did they take over the IP, but there was a client base, companies like Bell Canada, Bell South, uh, Federal Express, uh, Boeing, uh, Consumers Energy, on and on. So um, I worked with those firms implementing the uh, accomplishment-based curriculum development system. Uh, at the very end, just before he retired, he uh, produced some additional tools called the uh, performance improvement process, which dealt with the non-learning, non-skills and knowledge components of a full system. And um, I would go out, uh, a sample project would be with FedEx. They put together a project team. Um, We'd go in and train them in one part of the process. We'd implement that part of the process, uh, do all the work as an intact team, um, and then train them in the next phase of the process and then do that work. And uh, so, for example, FedEx um, at its peak probably had more than 400 people trained in using those tools and processes, and they were using that uh, very widely. Um, Boeing was similar, Bell South, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that was my first company. Um, in 2001, I was approached by a software company called Saba that was one of the early learning management companies, and they acquired my company, Human Performance Technologies. Um, they continue to own the actual job aids and tools, uh, although they haven't done anything with them since 2001, unfortunately. Our intent was to embed these tools and processes into a talent management suite. Um, But this happened in early 2001. By the end of 2001, uh, the whole tech market had been decimated. Uh, Saba made it through, but uh, literally by the skin of its teeth. And uh, we never moved forward doing any any of the things we anticipated with the uh, intellectual property. So my deal was for three years. In 2004, that was up. I started a firm called Exemplary Performance. Continued to do some training with those tools, but really was much more of a consulting delivery of services company than a training company per se. So we were using the same tools and processes um, around the globe uh, with with companies uh, for our audience that doorbell was the AC repairman and uh, we are past the midpoint of June so it was an emergency call Um, (laughs) where you were Paul is that you had just started talking about starting up exemplary performance yes did you perfect so in 2004 um My deal with Saba was done. I left and started Exemplary Performance. Um, At that time, um, they were very gracious in that Microsoft had been a client prior to the acquisition, and they allowed Microsoft to continue to be a client with Exemplary Performance following the acquisition. Mm -hmm. So this year, I've been working with that particular client for 20 years now, Mm -hmm. uh, doing this kind of work. Along the way, I've worked in manufacturing, financial services, pharmaceutical, uh, et cetera. Um, Been in many corners of the globe uh, for clients and uh, really learned a lot along the way. Um, So I grew a team, a small team. We were always kind of a quote-unquote boutique consulting firm. That means small. (laughs) It would be nice if it meant more than that. But uh, we were truly a boutique firm because we had a particular niche. That's how, even though at our peak we were about eight or ten folks, we had clients like Microsoft, like HSBC, like AstraZeneca, 
because we were bringing a, un a unique approach to driving results. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, had that firm, uh, it's still in place, but November last year, uh, I'm at a point in my life where I continue to love doing the work, but didn't want to be running a business. So I joined Shift, S-H-I-F-T. Uh, the website is Shift the Work, all one string, uh, where they're, they've been focused for the past 17 years on high engagement. In about 2014 or 15, we started to team with some of their clients, bringing together high engagement with high performance. And uh, so it just was a great fit. And they approached me about working with them on a full-time basis. So I became an employee back in November of 2017. And uh, that's been a, a great working relationship. Continue to have the clients that Exemplary Performance had and obviously have added, uh, well, they've added clients, but I've had access to a broader client base because of the clients they had. So that's kind of a summary. Uh, really, I think... Um, I've had the privilege uh, of understanding the rich meaning of taking an accomplishment-based approach, understanding uh, the distinction between subject matter experts and accomplished performers, and helping organizations have measurable results by improving the performance of their teams. Mm -hmm. Just, can you talk a little bit about uh, your 2013 book that you did with uh, Al Folsom, Exemplary Performance? Yes, uh, in fact, our, I will start off. Uh, since the company name was Exemplary Performance, we hadn't thought about that as a title, but the publisher ended up saying, you really ought to go with that as the title, and we ended up doing that. Uh, we were fortunate in that ISPI in 2014 uh, recognized it as the uh, publication of the year for 2013. Um, and we really tried to build a narrative around the models and work processes that Joe had produce the tools around. He didn't do a lot of writing of articles. Uh, he wrote a couple of books, An Ounce of Analysis, um, The Eden Conspiracy, so, but they weren't really in depth about the processes and tools that he had produced. He let those stand for themselves, which they were more than able to do, Guy, as you're well aware. So we, in Exemplary Performance, the subtitle is uh, Driving Business Results by Benchmarking Your Star Performers. Um, in that book, it's in two parts. The first part says, here's how we get the data. So it talks about front-end analysis. It talks about accomplishment-based models. It talks about using accomplished performers. Uh, more than subject matter experts. By the way, they're not mutually exclusive. You have some SMEs who are APs, uh, but the overlap, if you drew a Venn diagram, uh, the overlap is nowhere near 100%. It's probably more like 10 or 15%. So in our mind, there's a, a deep difference between people who can tell you all the whys but aren't successful in, in actually executing the processes or producing the desired results. They're your subject matter experts. They may design a process. They uh, can do great things, but they may not be able to operate the process at a consistently high level. And if we want to improve the work of others, we need to focus on accomplished performers, people who consistently produce outstanding results and use them as the source for decoding expertise. Uh, and so the first half talks all about identifying your stars, aligning with the client, understanding the business drivers, 
identifying your stars, doing the kind of case-based analysis we do in FEA uh, to capture and codify what works. The second half of the book says, how do we use that to elevate the performance of everyone in the organization uh, to get it closer to the level of your highest performers? Uh, You know, we so underestimate the gaps between good and great. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mentioned working with the financial institution. I've I've worked with many, but in one case, I was working with a global private bank or one of the largest private banks in the world. And uh, we were looking at multiple roles and using this process. Uh, But one of the roles, I think of them as financial advisors. They called them relationship managers. doesn't make any difference. But they had the clients and they had the assets under management. And the average for the entire bank was $300 million per financial advisor of assets under management. To be in the high performing pool, the accomplished performers, it was double that. It was actually about $630 million of assets under management. And I had the privilege of spending a half day with Charlie in London at the private bank. He had $3 billion of assets under management, 10 times the average and five times what it took to be in the high performing pool. And we just look at that and say, well, talent, and I'm using that intentionally, is randomly distributed. We hire people under a normal curve. They're going to perform under a curve. And we accept that variance because of a, 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 a really deeply broken model. Because if we hire under a normal curve and people perform under the same distribution, I would argue we can eliminate all management from all companies because they're not adding any value. Okay. The primary accomplishment of managers should be high performing direct reports. And if you hire A, B, and C players and three years later you still have A, B, and C players, the manager's not adding value. So, uh, now, I'm slightly overstating the case, but... I'm not sure that you are. I I would agree (laughs) wholeheartedly with what you're saying here. And so the book talks about how managers, the second half, can use the, what's been captured through the FEA process and improve hiring, improve learning or readiness, um, improve their processes and resources, coach more effectively, and recognize and reward better, all based around uh, the model of high performance captured from your stars. I I certainly agree with that. That's excellent. Thank you. We have covered uh, your introduction to human performance technology or performance improvement or whatever you call it because it's got various names. Um, so let's shift here to uh, who else were some of your biggest influences back in the day? People or articles or books that others may sure. wish to investigate? Okay. Well, uh, certainly, um, you know, Joe Harless was my mentor. And so he shaped me uh, more than anybody else. And of course, he was shaped by Tom Gilbert. And so human competence is, is a classic. Um, the most critical concept in there for me, I mean, there's, it's so rich, but it is the whole focus, shifting the focus from uh, behaviors to accomplishments, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think we're open to rabbit trails in this interview, so I'll take a rabbit trail. <laughs> Go ahead. You know, Uh, Most people who've spent time in human learning and instructional design have been exposed to various models of evaluation. Probably the uh, Kirkpatrick's the most widely known, and now you have Jack and Patty Phillips. And, and, uh, you know, one of the challenges people have faced 
uh, or one of the positions people have taken historically is that, boy, it's, it's really rough to get to level three. And for all intents and purposes, they'll say it's impossible to get to level four. And uh, in case anybody who's listening isn't familiar with that, uh, level three is looking at behavioral change in the workplace from learning, and level four is business impact from learning. And then Jack and Patty Phillips would have level five return on investment. So my question is, if you can't measure business impact, how can you justify business funding? How can you have a part of an enterprise that can't show that it's adding to the strategic impact and helping to achieve the, the purposes and mission and revenue targets of the organization? And so my comment would be twofold. One, you can never do that kind of analysis uh, looking for level three and level four retroactively. All those measures have to be in place up front at the beginning of the project. And when you have an accomplishment, accomplishment-based model, it's absolutely transparent where, how you can determine business impact. So the idea that it's a challenge is because you wait till after the project and then try to figure out some way to show it had an impact. Uh, I'm going to take one second break. All right. All right. Uh, right here to the left of the stairs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're you're talking about the need to establish your baseline measurements. Yeah. Yep. And so that you have something to measure against, and that's you know an agreed upon set of measures that you would use with your clients. From my perspective, too many in the business focus on tasks and not topics. And when you're trying to push that wet noodle of topics into the workplace learning, what's not clear is the accomplishment. You know, what does that really lead to and how was that measured in the business using either the current business metrics so that you have an agreement and yeah, so I think it's a, but I think that that's really it. Too many people are focused on topics and not tasks. Yes, and when, yes. you're t when I talk about tasks, I really mean the outputs and the tasks associated yes. with the output so that yep. you're looking at where the outputs, what are the tasks that enable that, and then what topics might need to be part of that task and output focus. But, you know, we're, I, we can preach yes. our, 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 we're both in the same choir, I think, regarding all of that. Um, so who else? Who else is uh, besides Joe and uh, the, yes, the marvelous right. uh, late Joe Harless? Yes. Uh, who else is on your uh, list of uh, influencers? Well, um, right about that time. Well, um, so let me get the time frame. When I had my first company, I ended up being on the board of ASTD, mm -hmm. now ATD. Uh, they wanted to broaden their focus and start to look more through a performance lens. Um, and so on the board with me uh, was Gary Rumler. Of course, I had already been familiar with his book, Improving Performance. Um, but had a chance to work with him and, and uh, on a professional level, and also through the board got to meet Jim and Dana Gaines Robinson. Uh, but but Gary, his book on improving performance, uh, I had encountered before I met him. And I was doing a lot of work at Ford Motor Company, and every manager workspace I would go into, it seemed. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's not quite true. But every manager workspace I would show up at had a copy of improving performance on, on the desk or on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And he had had tremendous impact in the context of Ford Motor. Uh, and so it was through that 
that I first got the book and, and read the book, you know, look back now and how many of us use a swim lane process mapping yes. and so many of the tools uh, that he initiated and designed. Um, there's a, uh, a network of folks who look at process improvement from an industrial engineering perspective, mm -hmm. and they attribute much of their field to Gary Rumler. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that way of viewing the world, I think, further illuminated uh, the tools. So Gary had produced tools. Joe's tools were uh, much more detailed in the documentation, as you know. Uh, um, some folks called Joe Mr. Job Aids, and, and so he had job aided everything. I, I think he probably had job aided how to get dressed in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, he just defaulted to that tool so so. Uh, frequently but uh, but Gary's gave this higher level process perspective that I found invaluable mm -hmm. um, and of course there's scores of other books some of the m more recent ones uh, in, uh, I haven't worked with Jeff Colvin but talent is overrated I think everybody in our field should read uh, he's the uh, senior editor or executive editor for Fortune magazine, and uh, uh, basically he looks at. It's a much more substantive book, and with no offense to Malcolm Gladwell on outliers, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Colvin's book uh, goes into more depth, and basically argues against, as we should, this whole model of um, hiring the right talent is the way to have a successful business. Mm -hmm. I can, uh, I'll talk about that more later. And then the other book that's only about two years old, maybe a year old, uh, both Malcolm Gladwell and Jeff Colvin talked about the 10,000 hours it takes to become a deep expert, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's true for a very small subset of roles that, and there are those that take extremely high psychomotor components to succeed. So world-class athletes, world-class musicians, surgeons, uh, et cetera. Most fields don't take anywhere near that. But regardless, both of them were basing that 10,000 hour model inaccurately inaccurate in the sense they were applying it to everything. Mm -hmm. They were taking that from the work of Anders Ericsson, who's probably the expert in expertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just wrote a book called Peak, uh, which again, I think, will become a classic for those of us in this field. Um, he talks about how do you really build expertise, and uh, uh, it's really a good read at many levels uh, and he kind of blows out of the water uh, I'll be careful well I won't be careful how I say this I think the biggest scam in HR and learning for the past 30 years has been the idea of competency modeling that by giving people discrete skills, they'll figure out how to do the work. It just simply doesn't work. And in peak, uh, Erickson points that out in peak. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I, uh, I'm sitting here with my leg elevated because I broke my ankle four weeks ago. I, just imagine if when I showed up at the surgeon, he had a PhD in physiology and anatomy uh, and had studied bone structure, but never had done the surgery. I, I don't know what you would have done. I would have passed. Yes. Right. I would have passed. Uh, you don't become competent by mastering competencies. We don't use the words in the same way at all. Mm -hmm. When we talk about someone who's competent or accomplished, 
they produce the right results. Competencies are chunks of useful information. I'm not saying we don't, people don't need those skills or that information, but when you learn it in isolation, it simply doesn't transfer. Exactly. I, to me, they've always been enabling knowledge and skills, but yes. they're not the terminal yes. performance that you really desire. Yes. So it takes you at best halfway there if it takes you that far at all. Yes, right. Yeah, so they're necessary but not sufficient. Yes. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> we could talk about this for hours, Guy, and I won't do that, but uh, <laughs> I, partially because of my surgery four weeks ago when I broke my ankle, uh, but I've been thinking about why do we train some professions and, and jobs and roles totally differently than we do others? Mm-hmm. Okay. Commercial airline pilots, surgeons, physicians, physician assistants. Uh, there, 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 there are all these roles where we expect people to demonstrate competence. And then there's all these other roles where we just, if, if they have competencies, we're, we're happy. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I, I haven't figured out how we reached the conclusion as a culture uh, that some roles should be trained well and others should be hit or miss. But it seems like we have, anyway. Yes, I uh, think, so I think we've, we, accept, we accept those things for, to me it's always been about risk and reward, which are two sides of the same coin in my mm-hmm. But if there's high risk and high reward, we tend to and make those investments because of the return on investment, the, yes. return on investment, yes. the potential yes. PIP, potential yeah. performance improvement potential. Yeah. Um, and for those that are less, we just we just don't we we don't do that because the the returns really aren't there. And so, to me, it's somewhat of a perhaps a logical business decision that we're willing to forego temporary performance for some to start hoping that they climb the learning curve and performance curve and, and yes. actually get there. But it's but it's yes. managed. And your point exactly. earlier yes. about managers, uh, do we even really need them if they're not going to really take their B and C players and get them closer to A? They may never get to the A level, yep. but they can get to B plus, and or at least we can move them up that performance curve and um, improve their performance and improve their lives and improve the results for the enterprise. Right. Um, uh, going back, to, I mean, just think, and you mentioned the PIP, the potential to improve performance. If you go back to that example of the private bank, mm-hmm. you know, there, there were about, I think, 1,200 financial advisors, or they called them RMs, relationship managers. Right. Uh, not everybody's going to have a $3 billion portfolio, but if the people with $300 million, let's and that was probably 1,100 of the 1,200, mm-hmm. suppose by learning from what Charlie was doing, they went up, they closed the gap by 1%. Mm-hmm. Okay? I, I think my math is right. That's $27 million times 1,000 people mm-hmm. of assets under management by a 1%. And I've never seen a gap. Well, that was the biggest gap percentage-wise I've ever seen, but... I've never seen one where the gap can't be closed by three to five percent, almost yes. by falling out of the chair. I mean, there's just so many obvious things that can be changed. Uh, yeah. So when and, you look at the potential return and dollarize that, you know, it's if uh, one of the things I learned from the quality movement is the cost of nonconformance versus the cost of conformance. So mm-hmm. if the cost of nonconformance is that. 27 times a thousand and you do that math that's what's at stake if you only got a small percentage of that you would never question what's it going to cost to get there what do you mean two three million dollars for training or changing the recruiting system and and all of the rest of that it's peanuts compared to what the potential upside is um absolutely but but too many so so isn't it a bit frustrating that you've had these masters the the Joe Harless is the Gary Rumlers, and there's dozens and do- and the Robinsons, and yes. dozens and dozens yes. and dozens more, and yet there's so little traction in this uh, 
pursuing uh, this performance orientation yes. and yes. Uh, accomplished yes. performance. Um, it, to me, it's part of the reason why I'm doing these videos is so that I can begin to capture that and hopefully help other people see, you know, that there's another way. There's another yes. way to think about it. There's another yep. way to approach doing this. It's not some uh, un charted territory the charts are there the job yes. aids are there yes. by a guy named yes. joe harless it's all laid out and you can adopt and adapt as needed to get yourself to uh, having greater impact yes yeah I, I it, it's a great frustration for me and i i really don't understand how uh, and I see myself, I'm not, you know, how we haven't gotten more, more traction. Mm -hmm. We get it with individual clients. Partially, there's this whole phenomena as leadership changes in the client organization, yeah. their metric of success is bringing in new models and new tools. Mm -hmm. So even if there's a, a track record of success with models, they, people don't seem to believe that models can be persistent, can, can add value over time. Right. Uh, and the other thing is, for whatever reason, um, our field hasn't gotten the the cachet or the press of certain things. Like, how did competencies take off? It'd be interesting to look at that. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, not based on results because there's almost no evidence that competency models pr produce high results, uh, which is because they don't. So yeah, good right. Well, it. Don but, Toasty, the late Don Toasty, yeah. would uh, told me on one of these videos uh, back in 2008 that the that the competency movement was from Hay Associates who did the compensation for managers and be and where the compensation model used to be based on how big was your staff and your budget and therefore if your staff was larger and your budget was larger you got paid more as a manager well that was not going to fit the new world as it was changing back in the late 70s and early 80s and so they went to this model of competencies and you would pay for more competencies so it became an hr checklist to see who's got what and adjust the compensation accordingly but mm -hmm. but anyway that was his story on where that came from because i myself have railed against this this concept of competencies and this focus on competencies and you're you're not getting you know maybe maybe you're getting halfway to performance but but it's not going to get you well, there by all by itself yeah it, it, yeah the, there's the underlying premise that somehow people will take these distinct skills that are valuable mm -hmm. and put them together optimally for results. And again, it just it doesn't get there. Very, very small percentage of people happen. And then the other big thing, uh, another big movement that really captured the imagination of people was talent mm -hmm. and talent management. And, you know, the war for talent. And we're getting back to the point, you know, uh, I forget who the author was, but he was with McKenzie, the consulting group, who wrote the book, The War for Talent. And it was, the under the underlying premise was, if you got people with lots of capability, right. they would become high performers. And uh, again, that's a false premise. Uh, it takes lots of capability to become a high performer, but having lots of capability doesn't make you a high performer. And then the, I'll jump back just for a second to Anders Ericsson and, and, and Peak. Mm -hmm. Probably, I mean, it's a wonderful book and it, in a sense, reinforced a lot of the things I believe. But the area that kind of illuminated a whole new thing for me was, I, I think I use the idea of talent the wrong way uh, in that it was like this... God-given gift at birth, and what you wanted to do was get up uh, you, uh, to leverage the talent you had. Mm -hmm. And he provides the evidence that, that blows that out, out of the water because 
uh, we know that the brain is a plastic, that you know, plasticity. Uh, we thought it was a fixed entity mm-hmm. at one point, and talent's the same thing. It's not a level that you want to attain. It's something you can expand through rehearsal. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, the whole idea, and again, his research was leveraged by Colvin and, and Gladwell, et cetera, of deliberate practice. Mm-hmm. How do you improve over time? Um, and there, I don't want to say there's no limit to what can be achieved, but it's a whole lot higher than what we think. And the idea of talent management is to find people with certain talents and get them in the right roles. Right. Again, like it's a fixed entity. Mm-hmm. And um, that isn't supported by the science. Uh, and that would not, that would uh, discourage people from growing their own talent internally. You'd think that you internal. need to bring it in from outside and therefore you stymie people in their career paths because you put them in a uh, certain box and think yes, that they're limited exactly. without seeing the potential upside for each individual yes. and, and groups. We're, we're doing a project right now with Microsoft and we're teaming with a uh, another Microsoft vendor. Uh, so we're both working with the same client and they're a data analytics company and, uh, and it's... Um, Fascinating because instead of looking at high performance on one or two variables, we selected the high performers based on 13 variables and uh, a very sophisticated data model. And now we're working with the managers to lessen the gaps between A, B, and C players, Mm -hmm. right? And so we're using the variables, the same variables we use to select as a way of measuring improvement over time. And so we can watch the individuals gravitate. If you think of a a four cell matrix, uh, the vertical axis is level of performance. The horizontal axis is decrease in variability between people on the team. Mm -hmm. And so we can watch as we train the managers to coach what we want to see is obviously the performance of his or her team increase, but the variability decrease. Mm-hmm. So we can actually see the impact of the manager because uh, it, this happens to be in sales and a sales team can have one superstar and make the whole team, make the manager look like a star. Right. But this now gives us a data-driven way to look at the improvement in manager performance as reflected in decreased variability on the team Mm -hmm. and high performance, right? We don't want decreased variability. We don't want the lower left. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, They're all lousy. Right. He or she seems to be able to make them all more lousy. Uh, What we're looking for is, uh, you know, the manager who can uh, elevate the performance of the team while having everybody perform uh, more like the best. Mm-hmm. That reminds me of my exposure to Neil Rackham, who I met, uh, Neil Rackham of spin selling fame, and mm-hmm. when he was at Motorola mm-hmm. in 1981, he did not have spin uh, sales training for the sales reps. His model was all about the manager and teaching the manager to be a coach and to observe salesmen, uh, salespeople out in the field, and to not interrupt and save the sale, but to wait and do the coaching afterwards and before the next sales call. And it was funny, they did a, a, a pilot in Canada, and they had control groups, and the, man, and the executives of the control groups got angry because their results were nothing like the improvements they saw. So anyway, so they ended up having to train everybody and Motorola forced Neil to create sales training for the sales reps because no one could get it through their heads that really what you really wanted was the sales manager as the leverage of performance of, but but anyway, so yeah, that's, I, that's... I, I believe in the coaching and we I often wonder the the like the late Roger Chevalier's book about, uh, 
you know, training managers to be coaches, to have them help their teams, their staff become better performers by using a lot of the tools and techniques of the Joe yes. Harlises and the Gary Rumlers and et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Um, it seems like we have just fallen so short of our PIP, our <laughs> Yes. performance improvement potential yes. as a field as a sub-discipline um of course too many focus on learning rather than yep. the terminal performance yep um ah madness yes. yeah. um let me segue if i can to uh so many people in the field struggle with explaining uh what they do and if you'll recall the late Claude Lineberry had his letter from Mama that he's that he uh, read to uh, ISPI and SPI conferences back in the day, where she was expressing her frustration with not understanding what it is that he did for a living. He yeah. so it, he was a very humorous talk and all of that. But so many of us struggle how to position ourselves with our internal or external clients and and with a. So, what would your thirty second elevator speech be, or what is it that you found? works for you in explaining, you know, what it is you do uh, to get that short answer yes. out there to, so that you can continue the conversation if there's interest. Great. And um, I'll make a comment before I give you that answer. And the comment is my first company was called Human Performance Technologies. Mm -hmm. And my second was called Exemplary Performance because while it's focused on the opportunity with people, um, it's really about driving business results through people mm -hmm. or organizational results. I mean, obviously sure. it works for nonprofits and all that. Mm -hmm. But uh, so uh, basically when, when asked about what I do, I, I talk about the idea of think of the two or three people inside your organization who day in and day out have the greatest impact and what would be the impact on your organization if th that was replicated multiple times over? Mm -hmm. So try to put it in the context of the business. Mm -hmm. Yes, people. Uh, yes, you have exemplary performers. But it's about exemplary performance, which can be applied to teams or individuals or departments or enterprises and uh, uh, really try and focus on determining up front where, where is that impact what what would make your day really unbelievable as a leader uh, inside your organization mm -hmm. can you well, you're a lifelong learner um, you're still reading and you're still out there working and consulting and, and helping uh, your client organizations uh, leverage their uh, accomplished performers. But so besides your new company or including that, yes, what's your yes. focus for your learning and writing? And so where, where are you going? What do you see yourself heading off to learn more about uh, so that you can apply it in, in your work? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I'm just finishing up another book with another co-author. The, the title, uh, is the working title, I think it'll be the final title, is, is Thrive. Um, and it's the, the co-author is a, a guy at Shift, uh, Andrew Friedman, and we're looking at this melding together of high engagement and high performance. Um, and so there's so much going on right now in areas like neuroscience, et cetera. Um, and in the area of, of expertise, <clears throat> what, how do experts develop and evolve? Um, so I think they're, they're the areas that I'm, I'm uh, paying more attention to. Um, and for me, the other untapped kind of horizon is systems and 
in apps and tools to make to enable the kind of thinking that has been vested in this field over the past 50 years Mm -hmm. more readily available. I mean, to me, one of the greatest travesties, not only in our field, uh, but in terms of business success, is that the, the thinking and tools and processes and job aids of, of Joe Harless and Gary Rumler, et cetera, haven't been uh, turned into systems. Mm-hmm. And of course, given that I've worked with Microsoft for the past 20 years and seen them rapid growth, plateau, and now take off like a rocket again, uh, because of the cloud because of machine learning and AI and and um, it just seems like there is no technological reason why we haven't built the tools that are, would, would allow the wide scale implementation of this kind of an approach mm-hmm. uh, in terms of documented processes in my opinion, the job aids Joe produced are as relevant today as they were 20 years ago because conceptually they're, they're built on ideas that are not time-based. Mm-hmm. But they'll never be consumed as paper job aids. Right. Uh, they'll never get leverage. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... Uh, that, you know, <laughs> if we could take what we truly know from Harless and Rumler and Wallace and um, Erickson and Colvin was more, he, he's not real, he really is a synthesizer of information. But if we took the work that's been done, I don't think there's an organization in the world that couldn't be performing at a 10 or 15% higher level. Mm -hmm. If that was instrumented in a way, just like there is a uh, ERP for operating the business, uh, we need a performance optimization Mm -hmm. tool set. One would have hoped that ERP as a extension of uh, MRP and MRP2 the manufacturing requirements planning yes. and and uh, or materials requirements planning, then evolving to uh, manufacturing requirements planning to enterprise requirements planning. One might have thought that that as a house to focus on the performance of processes and what are all all the enablers needed to make that happen. That that would have been the backbone of a tool set. You could should be able to attach all all these uh, tools and all the concepts and processes and techniques of the uh, uh, Harlesses and Rumblers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. to that. And because that was the focus on business processes. Now, where yes. did it yes. where did it go in the ditch? Is it or is it just yes. well, that when we try to uh, form tools, there are two permanent and not flexible enough and can't evolve with the rapid changes going on inside the enterprise. I, I don't know. Yeah. But I, yeah. yeah, I wish that uh, we could see, you know, the Joe Harless things, uh, his job aids, his paper job aids tr- turned into what uh, Gloria Gary called the electronic performance support systems. And yes. it's, yep. you know, the, the technology is there, the, ubiquitousness of the tools that we all carry yes. around with us um, you know what's holding it back I don't know yep. it's, it's kind of crazy yep. uh, let, well, let me segue here into uh, the next question here in my script which is uh, is there a favorite uh, HPT or performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us be, perhaps because you feel the current understanding or use of that term is somewhat problematic. Okay, so uh, 
two things come to mind, not because the current use is problematic, but perhaps because they're not used to the best of my inf- best of my knowledge. Okay. The whole talent management thing, I, I understand the origins and, and the concepts are uh, useful. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I would shift it from talent management to talent optimization. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, really, the way I see that field right now, it's about getting the right people with the right skills in the right slots at the right time. Mm-hmm. It, it's not, and it's, I'm, I'm making a, somewhat of a false dichotomy, but it's not um, how do we elevate and escalate and accelerate what people bring to the table in the kind of systematic and systemic ways that a, a uh, Anders Ericsson would say, this is how you really drive higher levels of performance. So that would be one. Mm-hmm. The other is goes back to the whole ERP thing and, uh, and all that. Um, no one inside of organizations owns all the buckets or the categories of influences. In, in the book, Exemplary Performance, we put it into six arrows, uh, but uh, be it six or Joe used four, uh, uh, Gilbert used six, uh, um, by the way, I, I didn't, there were so many other people along that line of, of uh, the heritage that I've been influenced by. And, you know, I'm just thinking I, sure. I could list 27 different names and I, I won't do that. I think I know but, where you're going. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, there's so many. But um, nobody owns the integration of all those things. Mm -hmm. HR owns recognition and rewards and compensation, Mm -hmm. but not consequences. The the line management owns uh, coaching and guidance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, But we need to be able to create barrier-free work systems, not in the sense not only in the sense of American with Disabilities Act, mm-hmm. although I totally concur with my broken ankle, I'm more cognizant of it <laughs> than normal. Uh, but, you know, high performers succeed, and this is Gary Romer, succeed in spite of, not because of the system in which they operate. Right. Right. And they found the ways to work around the barriers. Mm-hmm. What would happen if you walked in on a Monday morning and every resource you need was readily available at point of need, all the processes were clearly defined, your manager spent her time or his time keeping you out of unnecessary meetings, giving you exactly the right coaching, your compensation and recognition and reward system was totally aligned to what you're actually supposed to be doing, your job description, (laughs) anyway, you get the idea. If, uh, this idyllic world that we're capable of producing, but don't. So the other thing, so this is a, a, I can ramble, I apologize, but the idea of a chief performance officer, mm-hmm. someone reporting to the CEO or to the board who works across staffs and across the line to create barrier-free work settings where people can succeed at the level they intended to the day they were hired. I mean, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Utopian. Yes. Um, Yes. Yeah, one way. One, I think that the uh, chief operating officer should, you know, own that. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I and, yes, and maybe that's a better model than one more C-level position. I mm-hmm. don't know if we need... Or you fold you know, it in or something, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's the whole performance uh, orientation and, and of course, yes. what does that mean? Um, if, anyway, yes. I Yes, thank you for articulating all of that. That's uh, 
Well, let me let me segue here before we wrap up here. Part of what I'm looking for in this uh, HPT legacy videos are those like you who have been in the field for years or decades, yes. um, decades. decades. Um, and, I, and so I'm interested in stories of some of the people from the past who may still be with us or may not be with us, but I'd like to bring them to life. I'd like to keep them in our collective memories as to some of the uh, contributions they made. And, and your stories can be humorous or just factual, uh, something that you know helps us uh, keep them alive and, 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 make, and understand that they're humans. Um, that they're not some godlike uh, creature that came here and uh, sh showed us the way and then disappeared when we faltered. Um, so in our earlier conversations, we talked about that, that, that perhaps you might have a story or two on Joe Harless or Gary Rumler and perhaps others, but uh, what are some of your memories of the past that you can share with us? Um, well, there are many. Uh, with Joe, there was always humor, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I remember one evening ISPI was in Atlanta, and uh, uh, Joe had my wife and myself. Uh, I remember Doug Mead was there. Doug had been at Consumers Energy for years. I mean, Doug's a fascinating guy um, because he was in a power company uh, and ended up through our tools and models became a, a direct advisor to the CEO for years on optimizing performance of consumers energy. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, so Doug was there. I forget who else, but there are several of us. And uh, Joe Harless and his wife, Carol, um, Carol is a world-class sculptor. Mm -hmm. uh, they had taken over this old cotton broker's home in, in uh, Noonan, Georgia. I've been there, yes. And it's a beautiful place. Uh, and uh, Joe had been very successful. You know, one of the things that he had done better than anybody else I know, everything he built, all of his tools, were paid for by clients up front. Mm -hmm and built for clients, but he retained the rights to them, which is good negotiation skills, yes. I think. So uh, anyway, he had been very successful um, and he had this uh, very large house. His office was the old carriage house, uh, which was probably 3,000 square feet. I mean, it would have held six or eight cars as I recollect, mm -hmm. it's been a while since I've been there. And we had this wonderful dinner. They were both gourmet cooks. Uh, and uh, we were sitting in what I would think of as kind of the library or family room, a pool table and a fireplace. And, and we were just talking and, and uh, we, we got talking about his home. And uh, he said, you know, I don't know why we have this place. He said, we live in this room in the kitchen because we both cook. Mm -hmm. And we used the dining room. And of course, by that time, their son Lee was an adult and gone. So, and we used the bedroom. He said, I have no clue why we have the other 23,000 square feet. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay. I knew the place was big, uh, but it was bigger than what I thought. <laughs> uh, but he always had that kind of sense of humor. And uh, um, they stayed there for a long time and built a beautiful studio for Carol, mm -hmm. for her sculpting. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was a funny story. The, um, I'm trying to think of anything else that, that's shareable. And right now, <laughs> I can't think of anything else. Uh, well, let's move on to uh, Gary Rummler. Do you have uh, some remembrance of him that you can share with us? Um, it wasn't uh, not something humorous, but, uh, oh, and I'll go back to Joe, too. Uh, uh, but G Gary was such a classy guy. I mean, he could fit in 
anywhere. Uh, and it was just a pleasure to be around him. I had the opportunity also to visit him in his home and, and uh, he was just uh, brilliant and focused and just a great guy. Uh, I'll go back to a funny story about Joe, and it ties to Doug Mead, who was there for that dinner that night mm -hmm. from Consumers Energy. Consumers had paid uh, to build part of the accomplishment-based curriculum development materials. So, uh, And then they were paying to build what became the uh, performance improvement, uh, PIQ, performance improvement Boy, I'm drawing a blank on what he called the finer, final binder, mm -hmm. which dealt with all the non-learning interventions. And so they had, and obviously they were using them inside of consumers, and that was the, the rationale for paying for it. They got unlimited rights inside of consumers. And, uh, and Doug was the go-between, uh, Doug Mead. And, and so uh, the CEO asked to meet with Joe because they were investing a lot of money and they were getting a, a lot of value. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were investing a lot of money and Joe said, well, I'd be happy to meet with them. And Doug said, well, when could you come out? He said, oh, I'm not coming out there. He'd have to come here. <laughs> and, and that's just the way he was. Yeah. He, the CEO of this multi-billion dollar company wanted to meet with him and he said, that's fine, but I'm in Noonan. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> so there was that uh, interesting side of Joe. <laughs> Anyway. So, do you have a, a story of uh, on Rumler? Any remembrance? Um, yeah, you just just that sense of being a classy, ah. great guy to be around. Mm -hmm. But I can't think of a funny story about about Gary. Uh, we worked on some projects on the board of ASTD, mm -hmm. and then worked on some things outside of ASTD, and it was just always. Uh, well, let me interject a funny story about Harless and uh, um, Rumler. Joe told me this, so I have it captured on video, but uh, they were both very competitive. And yes, back when Joe worked. lived in New York, everybody that came to New York for business would stay at his house. And they he had a, a ping pong table, and uh, he was very competitive with the ping pong table. And... Uh, one time Gary came, the first time I guess, and they played ping pong and Gary beat him. And Joe couldn't stand it. So the next time <laughs> Gary came, Joe spiked his drink so that he could beat him. <laughs> but that's the way they were. Um, um, yeah, there's the great characters, uh, yes. interesting people, so willing to share, um, you know, Harless and, and uh, Rumler and so many people associated with uh, NSPI back in those days and ISPI later are just so open to sharing with people. I think it's a, um, a tribute to them and the organization that they, uh, I think, refer to as their professional home. Yes. It's a home to many of us and it, uh, it, it gave us so much. Um, well, uh, I guess uh, perhaps we can draw this to a close. I, Paul, I want to thank you again for uh, doing this interview over Skype. Um, and uh, I wish you all the, the best in your shift to shift. Uh, well, thank you. And I'm looking forward to uh, this next book of yours, um, Thrive. And uh, do you know when that's going to be coming out? Um, late, late this year, uh, late fall, uh, early winter, we're hoping it's, we're just get, getting into, into the final editing and then mm -hmm. we're getting, we're getting close. Well, we're excellent. getting close. Well, good luck with that. And, uh, and thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you've shared over the decades, because I recall attending many of your sessions and such, and, uh, you exemplify, that best trait of those people at NSPI and ISPI and your willingness to share with others um, what works. So again, thank you so much for this interview and, uh, and good luck in your future. Thanks. I had a fun time. Thanks for doing it, Kai. You're welcome. Okay.